After approximately 150 years of scholarly engagement with Egyptology, a consensus remains elusive regarding the true purpose of the Egyptian pyramids. While traditional Egyptology maintains that the pyramids served as tombs for pharaohs and their queens, dissenting voices propose alternative hypotheses, ranging from spiritual and mathematical functions to astronomical alignments. Notably, these alternative theories often focus on the Great Pyramid of Giza, leaving the other 130 pyramids in Egypt largely overlooked. Shouldn't any alternative hypothesis strive to encompass all pyramids rather than fixating on one, albeit significant, structure? By considering the mythology of ancient Egypt, a rich source of symbolic and cultural meaning, we may uncover valuable insights into how the ancient Egyptians perceived and interacted with their world. These insights could potentially bridge gaps in our understanding of history and either support or challenge existing hypotheses regarding the pyramid's purpose. In this video, we will explore one of these hypotheses with you. But first, support us by liking and subscribing to the channel to help us continue our research into the secrets of ancient Egyptian civilization. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. When discussing Egyptian pyramids, let's take Khafre's Pyramid as an example in this video, as it is one of the largest and still standing at Giza. The pyramid is made of locally quarried limestone blocks, each weighing around two tons, and features two passages, two portcullises, and a large granite coffer in the main chamber. The inner limestone blocks of the pyramid were covered by a layer of Tura limestone quarried across the Nile. The pyramid once had a pyramidion at its peak, which is currently missing. Comparing it to other pyramids, we find that many others built by the ancient Egyptian civilization throughout its long history exhibit similar features to this style. Let's suppose that the pyramid generates an electrical charge in the main chamber. Due to the excellent insulating properties of Tura limestone and the atmosphere it creates around the inner body of the pyramid, any charge generated would not leak out from the sides of the pyramid, but would instead move through the moist, saturated inner limestone towards the pyramidion at the top of the pyramid. As the charge density increases at the top, the air around the pyramidion ionizes, creating a coronal discharge that appears as a luminous glow reminiscent of the god Atum. This phenomenon is also known as St. Elmo's light and has been known since ancient times. Atum, the first god in Egyptian mythology, was closely associated with the Pyramidion. In fact, it was believed that he dwelled there and would bring illumination to anyone who could see it. However, the question here is, what did the ancient pharaohs mean by illumination? In my opinion, it was not spiritual illumination, but rather a literal light that they could see. However, as the ionization process continues inside the main chamber of the pyramid, two subsequent events will occur. Firstly, ion winds attributed to the god Shu the ancient Egyptian god of air, will arise. Ion winds are a process in which charged particles move, carrying air molecules with them. As the air moves upward from the pyramid, it will converge with the warmer air at the Earth's surface and transport it to lower atmospheric layers. There, the warm air will condense, creating rain or snow associated with the god Tefnut, the deity of moisture, which will then fall upon the pyramid. Interestingly, ancient Egyptians already had hieroglyphic symbols for snow and cold. However, this phenomenon is extremely rare in dry Egypt. So I wonder, where did the ancient Egyptians perceive cold? The concept of using charged particles to induce rain formation is not limited to science fiction, but has practical applications. Two companies, including Matteo Systems based in Zug, Switzerland, have developed rainmaking technologies based on this principle. Founded in 2004, Mateo Systems offers rain enhancement services to arid regions worldwide. While their technology has faced controversy, scientists working for the Abu Dhabi government have reported successful results, with 50 rainstorms occurring during hot summer months when using Meteo Systems products. Meteo Systems holds a patent titled Apparatus and Related Methods for Weather Modification by Electrical Processes in the Atmosphere. 
In simple terms, the company uses antenna arrays to generate negative charges at high voltage, which then combine with dust particles in the atmosphere to form water droplets, as illustrated in this figure on their website. This figure shows the antenna arrays used at the Abu Dhabi site. Drawing parallels, if Egyptian pyramids were releasing similar charged particles, they could potentially contribute to cloud formation associated with the god Seth and lead to rain. The Eye of Horus stands out as one of ancient Egypt's most prominent and widely recognized symbols. Yet its exact origin continues to baffle researchers. As charged particles ascend from the pyramidion to the upper layers of the atmosphere, they interact with air molecules, causing them to become excited and emit photons or light upon de-excitation. The resulting light's color varies depending on the type of molecule the charged particles collide with, ranging from red to blue hues. Imagine standing at Giza and witnessing a luminous phenomenon above the pyramid resembling the aurora borealis. In my view, the ancient Egyptians associated this celestial light with the eye of Horus. This increased illumination would enhance visibility, accentuating the separation between Earth, associated with the god Geb, and the sky, associated with the god Nut, a concept deeply rooted in Egyptian creation mythology. But what is the creation myth of the ancient Egyptians? The creation myth revolves around the emergence of nine major deities during the mysterious event known as Zep Tepi, or the first time. The nature of this first event and its timing remain a secret. Through the myth, we get to know Atum, the first god to be born, who had two children, Tefnut and Shu, who were the deities of rain and wind, respectively. Tefnut and Shu then gave birth to Geb and Nut, who were the deities of the earth and the night sky. This was followed by the birth of four more gods as their offspring. The story narrates about a mound where all nine gods were born. As I contemplate this myth, I wonder if all the gods were merely personifications of the natural phenomena they represented, and whether the mound symbolized the pyramid from which these phenomena emanated. Looking at the Egyptian pyramids, it's evident that many of them share a similar layout, including enclosure walls, temples, and causeways leading towards the Nile. Mark Lanner and his team from the Oriental Institute in Chicago reconstructed Khafre's Pyramid, a model of which is depicted in this figure. In my view, the purpose of the enclosure walls might have been to collect rainwater flowing down from the sides of the pyramid and channel it away from the site towards the Nile. This serves a similar function to the drainage systems around the foundations of modern houses, preventing soil erosion. Evidence of significant limestone erosion has been observed in Khafre's temples, the causeway, and the Sphinx enclosure, likely caused by water passing through. Dr. Robert M. Schock's research extensively analyzed water erosion on the Sphinx and its enclosure, attributing it to rainfall. He suggests that this rainfall helps date the Sphinx to the 5th millennium BC. However, could this rainfall have occurred closer to the traditional Old Kingdom dates, 2520 BC, 2465 BC, as proposed by conventional Egyptology? It's plausible to consider that the pyramids may have played a role in facilitating rainfall. The charged particles within the pyramids could potentially be harnessed for precipitation, though the exact mechanism of their production remains a topic of inquiry. When Giovanni Belzoni entered Khafre's pyramid in the early 19th century and examined the coffer, he did not discover gold nuggets, but rather found bull bones. The presence of bull bones in the coffers of many ancient Egyptian sites raises intriguing questions. If these bones were indeed brought as offerings for the deceased king, how did they end up inside the coffers, often with the lids closed? Let's consider a scenario from ancient times where someone placed an ox, bread, beer, and barley inside a granite coffer and sealed the lid. I've chosen these four ingredients because they were commonly used as offerings throughout ancient Egyptian history, presented at pyramids and temples. As fermentation begins inside the coffer, yeast converts the starch and barley into carbon dioxide gas, increasing pressure within the coffer. This pressure exerts mechanical stress on the granite coffer, which is composed of quartz crystals, known to generate electric charge under mechanical stress. More pressure results in more electric charge being generated. The precise composition of the granite material used for the coffer in Khafre's pyramid remains unknown, 
but it can be assumed to contain approximately 40% quartz crystals. Taking into account the coffer's size, quartz content, wall thickness, and a pressure of 250 mupa, I estimated that the coffer could generate around 100 kilovolts with no current. I based my assumption on a pressure of 250 numpa, which is roughly 1,000 times higher than the pressure in car tires, and is generally considered the limit for the strength of granite material. This pressure limit is also close to the maximum pressure that yeast can withstand. The ox or bull, which could have been placed in the coffer as part of an ancient ritual, is a source of oleic acid. Scientific studies have reported that oleic acid is crucial for yeast to maintain its growth rate and counteract the toxic effects of ethanol released during fermentation. Additionally, if someone were to open the coffer's lid millennia later, they would likely find only remnants of what the yeast did not consume before drying out. This could explain the presence of bull bones, which aligns with Giovanni Belzoni's findings. I want to explain here that I'm not saying the ancient Egyptians understood things like ionization or particle physics. It's more likely that they noticed something interesting in nature, and over time, through trial and error, they learned how to use it better. Think of it like practicing a skill and getting better at it over many years. The big-scale use of this knowledge probably started around 2680 BC when Pharaoh Djoser and his advisor Imhotep built the first pyramids. Imhotep is a famous figure in Egyptian history, and there are many stories about him. In 1889, Charles E. Wilbur discovered a stele on the island of Sihel, near Elephantine, carved on a large rock. The stele recounts a story from the time of Pharaoh Djoser. During a seven-year period, the Nile stopped flooding, leading to a scarcity of grain, dried up crops, and widespread distress among the people. In response, Pharaoh Djoser sent his advisor Imhotep to investigate. Imhotep traveled to Heliopolis and consulted ancient records to understand the Nile flood. He discovered that the flood was controlled by a weather god upstream near Elephantine, who was upset about his damaged temples. Imhotep took action by rebuilding the temples and offering sacred sacrifices to the weather god. Soon after, rain fell in Egypt, the Nile flooded again, and the people's suffering and famine ended. There was an abundance of grains for planting, growing, and consumption by the ancient Egyptians. This story raises the question of whether it was merely coincidental that the famine ended around the time of Imhotep's actions, including his involvement in pyramid projects and offerings to the weather god. In this figure, you can see the dominant wind direction for Giza and Mesopotamia. It's evident that the prevailing wind blows from Giza towards Mesopotamia, following the path along the Fertile Crescent as depicted in this figure. This leads me to an important point. If the ancient Egyptians indeed had the ability to create rain clouds, Mesopotamia would likely benefit the most from the resulting precipitation. The clouds would form along the Nile River where the pyramids are situated, and the wind would carry them towards Mesopotamia, bringing moisture and fostering life in that region. I'd like to mention an intriguing fact. Around 2250 BC, both Mesopotamia and Egyptian civilizations experienced a severe drought known in history as the 4.2 kilo year event. Historians and researchers acknowledge that this drought had a profound impact, leading to the collapse of the thriving, Akkadian civilization that had dominion over a significant part of Mesopotamia during that era. Studies suggest that approximately 75% of the population in ancient Mesopotamian settlements were displaced due to the consequences of this event. Additionally, neighboring civilizations to the east were also adversely affected. The intriguing aspect of this event is that its cause remains unknown. Typically, when such occurrences arise, researchers analyze reconstructed temperature data from Greenland, searching for any correlations with the weather patterns. However, when examining the data around 2250 BC, there is no apparent correlation. It's almost as if everything was proceeding as usual. Yet the evidence of the severe drought in Mesopotamia and Egypt during that time is indisputable. This raises the question, what could have possibly transpired? I can't help but contemplate whether someone during the Old Kingdom era intentionally or inadvertently disrupted the natural order, metaphorically speaking, pulling the plug of the pyramids. 
Instead of the usual rainy and cloudy weather that Mesopotamians and Egyptians were accustomed to for ages, they experienced relentless scorching sun heat, represented by Sekhmet. Finally, there's the legend of the Curse of Akkad, a renowned Akkadian poem that recounts the tale of King Naram-Sin, who looted the temple of a weather deity. A quote from one of the sources states, For the first time since cities were built and founded, the great agricultural tracts produced no grain. If the poem refers to deities like Tefnut, Shu, or their Akkadian counterparts who control weather, it's plausible to suggest that someone disrupted the structures responsible for maintaining favorable weather conditions, leading to a lasting change in the climate pattern of the region. I cannot say I did not think about the Egyptian authorities investing some effort and time into renovating one or the other pyramids they still have standing. The idea of selling weather to their eastern petroleum-rich neighbors sounds not bad at all to me. Somehow I feel selling rainy weather would bring Egypt way more revenue than selling something like petroleum, which I know Egypt does not have much. In contrast to what many may believe, I do not think petroleum is gold in that part of the world, but rain certainly is. Surely, rain would be appreciated by lots of customers if Egypt would like to invest in rainmaking service. In conclusion of this video, we find that the Egyptian pyramids hold many fascinating secrets and myths. By exploring the history of the pyramids and the surrounding myths, we learn about the ancient human capabilities in dealing with natural phenomena and ancient technologies that may be more advanced than we imagine. Ancient Egypt history appears as a cul-de-rail and historical treasure that attracts attention and serves as a source of inspiration for scientific studies and archaeological research. If you are interested in more information about ancient Egypt and its secrets, feel free to follow our channel for exciting and engaging content. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you in upcoming videos.